if you are somebody like Sundar Pichai or uh, Sam Altman at the head yeah. of a company like this, you're saying if they develop an AGI, they too will lose control of it. So no one person can maintain control. No group of individuals can maintain control. If it's if it's created very very soon and is a big black box that we don't understand, like the large language models, yeah, then I'm very confident they're going to lose control. But this isn't just me saying it. You know, Sam Altman and Demis Asabis have both said mm -hmm. themselves acknowledge that you know there's really great risks with this, and they they want to slow down once they feel it gets it's scary. It's, but it's clear that they're stuck in this. Again, Moloch is forcing them to go a little faster than, than they're comfortable with because of pressure from just commercial pressures, right? Uh, it, to get a bit optimistic here, of course, this is a problem that can be ultimately solved. Uh, it just to win this wisdom race, it's clear that what we hoped that was going to happen hasn't happened. The the capability progress has gone faster. Than a lot of people thought, and and the po the progress in in the public sphere of policy making and so on has gone slower than we thought. Even the technical AI safety has gone slower. A lot of the technical safety research was kind of banking on that um, large language models and other poorly understood systems couldn't get us all the way. Yeah. That you had to build more of a kind of intelligence that you could understand. Maybe it could prove itself safe. You know things like this, and. Um, I'm quite confident that this can be done um, so we can reap all the benefits, but we cannot do it as quickly as uh, <laughs> this out of control express train we are on now is going to get the AGI. That's why we need a little more time, I feel. Is there something to be said, what like Sam Altman talked about, which is while we're in the pre AGI stage, to release often and as transparently as possible to learn a lot? So, as opposed to being extremely cautious, release a lot. Don't uh, don't invest in a closed development where you focus on AI safety. While it's somewhat dumb, quote unquote, uh, release as often as possible. And as you start to see signs of uh, human level intelligence or superhuman level intelligence, then you put a halt on it. Well. What a lot of safety researchers have been saying for many years is that the most dangerous things you can do with an AI is, first of all, teach it to write code. Yeah. Because that's the first step towards recursive self improvement, which can take it from AGI to much higher levels. Okay. Oops, we've done that. And uh, another thing, high risk is connected to the internet, let it go to websites, download stuff on its own, uh, and talk to people. Oops, we've done that already. You know, Elias Yudkowsky, you said you interviewed him recently, right? Yes, yep. So he had this tweet recently, which I <laughs> got, gave me one of the best laughs in a while, where he's like, hey, people used to make fun of me and say, you're so stupid, Eliezer, because you're saying, you're saying, uh, you have to worry. Obviously, developers, once they get to like really strong AI, the first thing you're going to do is like never connect it to the internet, keep it in the box yeah. where, it has, you know, where you can really study it. Safe. So he had written it in the like in the meme form. So it was like then, yeah, and, and then that, and then now. <laughs> let's lol. Let's make a chatbot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the yeah. third thing, Stuart Russell. Yeah, you know, amazing AI researcher. He ha he has argued for a while that we should never teach AI anything about humans. Above all, we should never let it learn about human psychology and how you manipulate humans. That's the most dangerous kind of knowledge you can give it. Yeah, you can teach it all it needs to know how to, about how to cure cancer and stuff like that, but don't let it read Daniel Kahneman's book about cognitive biases and all yep. that. And then, oops, LOL, you know, let's invent social media al recommender algorithms, which do exactly that. They, they get so good at knowing us pressing our buttons that we've we're starting to create a world now where we just have ever more hatred <laughs> because they figured out that these algorithms not for out of evil but just to make money on advertising that the best way to get more engagement the euphemism get people glued to their little rectangles right is just to make them pissed off well, that's really interesting that a large ai system that's doing the recommender system kind of task on social media is basically just studying human beings because it's a bunch of us mm -hmm. rats 
giving it signal, nonstop signal. It'll show a thing, and then we give signal, and whether we spread that thing, we like that thing, that thing increases our engagement, gets us to return to the platform, and it has that on the scale of hundreds of millions of people constantly. So it's just learning and learning and learning. And presumably, if the, param the number of parameters in the neural network that's doing the learning, and more end-to-end -end the learning is, the more it's able to just basically encode how to manipulate human behavior, exactly. how to control humans at scale. Exactly, and that is not something you think is in humanity's interest. Yes. Yeah, it, right now, it's mainly letting some humans manipulate other humans for profit and power, which already <laughs> caused a lot of damage. And eventually, that's a sort of uh, skill that can tr make AIs persuade humans to let them escape uh, whatever safety precautions we had put. You know, there was a really nice article um, in the New York Times recently by uh, Yuval Noah Harari and, and, and um, two co-authors, including Tristan Harris from The Social Dilemma. And they have this phrase in there I love. It said that humanity's first contact with advanced AI was social media. And we lost that one. We now live in a country where there's much more hate in the world where there's much more hate, in fact. And in our democracy that we're having this conversation and people can't even agree on who won the last election, you know. And we humans often po point fingers at other humans and say it's their fault. But it's really Mo Moloch and these AI algorithms. We got the algorithms and then Moloch pitted the social media companies around against each other so nobody could have a less creepy algorithm because then they would lose out on alg revenue to the other company. Is there any way to win that battle back? Just if we just linger on this one battle that we've lost in terms of social media, is it possible to redesign social media, this very medium in which we use as a civilization to communicate with each other, to have these kinds of conversation, to have discourse, to try to figure out how to solve the biggest problems in the world, whether that's nuclear war or the development of AGI. Is is it possible uh, think, to do social media correctly? I think it's not only possible, but it's it's necessary. Who are we kidding that we're gonna be able to solve all these other challenges if we can't even have a conversation with each other? It's constructive. The whole idea, the key idea of democracy is that you get a bunch of people together and they have a real conversation. The ones you try to foster on this podcast where you respectfully listen to people you disagree with. And you realize, actually, you know, there are some things, actually, we some common ground we have, and let's, let's, yeah, we both agree, let's not have a nuclear war, let's, let's not do that, um, et cetera, et cetera. We're kidding ourselves thinking we can face the, off the second contact with, with ever more powerful AI that's happening now with these large language models if we can't even have a functional conversation in the public space. That's why I started the Improve the News project, mm -hmm. improvethenews.org. But um, I, I'm an optimist fundamentally in, um, in that there is a lot of intrinsic goodness in, in, in people. And that uh, what makes the difference between someone doing good things for, for humanity and bad things is not some sort of fairy tale thing that this person was born with an evil gene and this one was not born with a good gene. No, I think it's whether we put, whether people find themselves in situations that bring out the best in them or that bring out the worst in them. And I feel we're building an internet and a society that brings out the worst. But it doesn't us. have to be that way. No, it does not. So if you, it's possible to create incentives and also create incentives that make money, uh, that both make money and bring out the best in people. I mean, in the long term, it's not a good investment for anyone, you know, to have a nuclear yeah. war, for example. And, you know, is it a good investment for humanity if we just ultimately replace all humans by machines and then we're so obsolete that eventually there, there are no humans left? Well, it depends, I guess, on how you do the math. But, but I, if, it, I would say by any reasonable economic standard, if you look at the future income of humans and there aren't any, you know, that's not a good investment. Moreover, like, why why can't we have a little bit of pride in our species, damn it? You know, why, why should we just build another species that gets rid of us? If we were Neanderthals, would we really consider it a smart move if the... the if we had really advanced biotech to build homo sapiens, 
you 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 know you might say hey max you know yeah let, let, let's build build uh, these homo sapiens they're going to be smarter than us maybe they can help us defend us better against uh, predators and help fix up our caves make them nicer and we'll control them un undoubtedly you know and so then they build build a couple a little baby girl a little baby boy you know and and then you have some some wise old neanderthal elder who's like hmm I'm scared that uh, we're opening a Pandora's box here and that we're going to get outsmarted by these n n super Neanderthal intelligences and there won't be any Neanderthals left. And then, but then you have a bunch of others in the cave. Right? Are you such a Luddite scaremonger? Of course, they're going to want to keep us around because we are their creators. And and why, you know, the smarter, I think the smarter they get, the nicer they're going to get. They're going to leave us. They're going to... They're going to want this around, and it's going to be fine. And and besides, look at these babies; they're so cute. It's clearly, they're totally harmless. That's exact. Those babies are exactly GPT four. Yeah. It's not. I want to be clear. It's not GPT four. That's terrifying. It's the GPT four is a baby technology. You know, and Microsoft even had a paper recently out uh, with a title something like "Sparkles of AGI." Well, they were basically saying this is baby AI, like these little Neanderthal babies. And it's going to grow up. There's going to be other systems from the, from the same company, from other companies. They'll be way more powerful, and but they're going to take all the things, ideas from these babies. And before we know it, we're going to be like those last Neanderthals who were pretty disappointed and <laughs> when they realized that they were getting replaced. Well, this interesting point you make, which is the programming, is it's entirely possible that GPT-4 is already the kind of system that can change everything by writing programs. So, life three, it's yeah, it's because it's life two point oh. The the systems I'm afraid of are going to look nothing like a large language model, and they're not. Gonna, but once it gets, once it or other people figure out a way of using this tech to make much better tech. Right, mm -hmm. it's just constantly replacing its software, and from everything we've seen about how how these work under the hood, they're like the minimum viable intelligence. They do everything in a like, the dumbest way that still works, sort of. Yeah, and um, th so they are life three point Except when they replace their software, it's a lot faster than when you when when you decide to learn Swedish. <laughs> and moreover, they think a lot faster than us too. So when, uh, you know, we don't think on how one logical step every nanosecond or or, few or so the, the way they do, and we can't also just suddenly scale up our hardware massively in the cloud, which is so limited, right? Uh, so they are, it, it, they are also life can soon be, become a little bit more like Life 3.0 in that if they need more hardware, hey, just rent it in the cloud, you know? Mm -hmm. How do you pay for it? Well, with all the services you provide. 